Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Yeah, so I caught like uh, 5,000 bass with, with this one. Oh, hey, good yeah. morning, everybody. <laughs> it's a We're secret one, that's why. Some fishing stories coming up. <laughs> we'll be talking lures today a little bit later in the new newscast. Good morning to you. It's Friday. It is August 20th. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Happy Friday. We have some interesting news about the critters in our city. Yeah, City Life is actually making local wild animals fatter, according to a new study. <laughs> Poor animals. So anyway, <laughs> a team from the Florida Museum of Natural History, they are saying city dwelling mammals are getting bigger and fatter thanks to having more food around in areas packed with humans. Researchers examined the body length and weight of more than 140,000 animals from over 100 North American species for 80 years. The results find animals which often pop up in cities such as wolves, bobcats, deer, bats, shrews, and rodents are growing more than their rural relatives. That's right, their findings are actually the exact opposite of what scientists had assumed about what city life is doing to mammals. The old hypothesis called the urban heat island effect suspected that buildings and roads emit more heat than green spaces and in theory would cause higher temperatures in animals living in these conditions to be typically smaller. That's according to a biological principle called Bergman's rule. So what they said is this paper is a good argument for why we can't assume Bergman's rule or climate alone is important in determining the size of animals. And by the way, over the last decade, scientists have been sounding the alarm that global warming might be shrinking the prey that mammals eat in the wild, leading to smaller animals. But scientists have also cautioned that smaller animals may mean smaller or fewer offspring. I've seen my share of large raccoons in, in my <laughs> neighborhood. The same thing. <laughs> well, it didn't help that the picture on the oh, article yeah. of, the, <laughs> of a big old raccoon. Yeah. The study appears in the journal Communications Biology. All right, let's look at today's nine at nine. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton is suing San Antonio ISD after school leaders issued a vaccine mandate for staff. Paxton accuses the district of deliberately violating state law. The vaccine mandate is set to go into effect on October 15th. In the latest court battle over masks in schools, the Texas Supreme Court rules against Governor Greg Abbott. The ruling allows school districts in the state to enforce mask mandates. The number of hospitalized children and people under 50 has reached the highest level since the beginning of the pandemic. 93,000 Americans are fighting the virus from a hospital bed this morning. President Biden will address the evacuation is still underway in Afghanistan today. Thousands of Americans and their families are still waiting for a plane out. Around 6,000 people were cleared for evacuation yesterday. After avoiding duty at the state capitol for nearly six weeks, enough Texas Democrats have returned to continue the special session. Their return opens the door for the passage of the GOP elections bill that caused the chaos in the first place. For the first time on record, it rained instead of snowed at one of the coldest spots in the world, Greenland Summit. Temperatures rose above freezing for the first time this decade. Officials say this was the heaviest rainfall since record keeping began in 1950. They say that is a sure sign of rapid global warming. The U.S. Department of Education is canceling student loan debt for borrowers with severe disabilities. $5.8 billion in debt is being waived for more than 300,000 people. Car prices are expected to remain high. This after the world's largest automaker, Toyota, announced it will suspend production at more than a dozen plants because it can't get enough parts to build vehicles. Volkswagen is also signaling potential production cuts. Coming soon, Amazon department stores. The Wall Street Journal reporting the retail giant plans to open large brick and mortar locations in the U.S. Some of the first shops expected to pop up in Ohio and California, offering items by top consumer brands. And that's today's 9 at 9. So I wonder what that will do for existing brick and mortar stores. More competition, I think. Oh, huge competition. It, I mean, Amazon's already competition because mm -hmm. you get things right at your doorstep and then they have a neighboring store. It's gonna be a lot. Interesting. 902 right now, let's go outside with Live Cam. Justin, good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're seeing some clouds out there right now, some steamy conditions. Hey, good news, temperatures drop below 80 this morning, so there's that. Yesterday, we only got down to 80. It was a warm day yesterday, got up to 98 again. There's no reason to believe we won't be there again today. Right now, we're sitting at 81. Southerly winds at about 11 miles per hour. Dew point is at 73. That's an important number because it pushes that heat index 
much higher. 98, the forecast high today. That heat index will be somewhere around 104 here in San Antonio. So beware during the afternoon hours. It's not so fun to be outside. Here's a look at the area. Uh, high temperatures yesterday. We got it to 98 here in San Antonio, but look at those numbers down to the south and west. 105 in Catula, 100 in Carrizo Springs, 105 in Laredo, some big time heat. And here's the forecast for today. Again, 98 here in town, it'll feel like 104. Most places will have that heat index rise above 100. With the biggest numbers being down there around Catula, Beeville, and the Corpus area. Once again, your forecast looks like this 98. Southeasterly winds 10 to 20 miles per hour. Not much to talk about here, but there is a lot to talk about in the tropics. We're going to get you up to date there coming up in just a couple minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Taking a look outside with Trans Guide this morning. There's a look at Loop 410 and Babcock Road. Quite a few people on the road this Friday morning. Top stories we're following today on Northwest Side Apartment Complex is a crime scene this morning after a shooting. San Antonio police were called to the 7800 block of Callahan Road near I-10 around 5 this morning. And let's take a look at the scene. Police found a man inside one of the apartments with a gunshot wound to his stomach. Emergency responders rushed the man to the hospital. They did not give details on his condition. Investigators questioned multiple people at the scene, but the shooter had already left. Police used a helicopter to search from the air and at last check they're still looking for the person. The shooting is under investigation. San Antonio police are also busy with a separate shooting. This one happening just north of downtown. Now officers got the call around 430 this morning. This one happened at the corner store on Blanco at Mariposa Drive. That's where San Antonio police say two men were pushing a broken down vehicle right into the parking lot of that convenience store. The two men started arguing when police say one of them pulled out a gun and shot the other before taking off. One of those men was taken to the hospital. You see him right there. He's expected to be okay. Police say he is not cooperating with investigators. And there's updated guidance from the Texas Education Agency. The TEA is now dropping enforcement of the governor's order that made masks optional due to ongoing legal challenges. Along with allowing mask mandates, the agency says schools must notify all teachers, staff, and families of all students who were in the classroom or involved in any extracurricular activities involving that COVID positive student. School districts still must report cases of COVID-19 to health officials. And when it comes to de developmental help, germs, diseases, or even violence prevention, parents and caregivers may not always know where to start. As Alicia Beretta reports, there's an agency that offers free learning materials, including books or posters, year-round with the click of a button. And she joins us live right now with more on this story. Good morning, Alicia. Good morning, Alicia. Good morning. Well, it's probably an agency that people hear a lot about during the past year. The Centers for Disease and Control, or CDC, has probably become one that you mention or hear about daily. And yes, they're the go-to when it comes to the pandemic, but they also share other information that could be useful to your family. The best part, it's free. Head over to CDC.gov and click on their on-demand publications tab. The CDC can help parents of little ones read, sing, and play in a fun way. They have baby books, as you see here, including Baby's Busy Day, Where is Bear, and Amazing Me. They also have a milestones meter to help you keep track of your child's milestones, ages two months to five years. The CDC also offers this free illustrated checklist with tips on what to do if you are concerned about your child's development. For the bigger kids, you can order an unlimited amount of posters that encourage keeping their hands clean to fight off germs and of course to stay healthy you can also add some stickers that you see there to your cart you can share those at work or maybe maybe even at your child's school for those caring for a teen the cdc also offers a booklet on tougher discussions like intimate partner and sexual violence prevention it includes information on what to look out for and how to expand a dialogue at home and within the community and so you can also download these materials if you don't want to order them we actually did order some here at KSAC and they arrived pretty quickly. These materials, the cool thing is that they're also available in Spanish, including this little book here for children. So there's an option for, for families, right? If they want to talk about these things and just have educational materials. Yeah, I saw that book on your desk earlier. Yeah. Thank you, Alicia. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you, guys. And this morning, students from all over are moving into their dorms at Trinity University. And even though faculty and staff will not be able to help, the move-in process is still happening. Jonathan Cotto is there live. Jonathan, what are some of the changes staff and faculty have to make this semester? That shipment got stopped. 
Well, you know what, Mark Stephanie, they told us uh, the move in process, the move in day was going to be a little bit different, but the energy nonetheless has, has not changed. As you can see, we have just a number of staff and faculty excited to receive first year students here to Trinity University, welcoming these new Tigers on campus who are moving in to their dorm room this morning. Now, of course, in years past, they told us they would have at least 200 personnel, you know, staff and faculty helping parents move their, their kids into their dorm room. Today, it's just parents and their child. As you can see here, staff and faculty welcoming these parents. We also have a U-Haul on campus that's unloading all their equipment. We've seen everything from TVs to a large keyboard, believe it or not. And it's mom and dads that are doing all the work. They are surely exhausted, but there's plenty of water here on deck for them. Mark, Stephanie, we're going to continue to hang out here with uh, this move-in process. It's, I'm telling you, the energy is, is, is wonderful. Very, very happy to be here. These students are very happy to be moving in. We're going to keep hanging out with them. I'll toss it back to you. Mark, Stephanie. Thank you, Jonathan. And a shout out to all the parents out there. Thanks for all their help. Artwork and moms and dads. Jonathan, thank you. Have a good weekend. Our back to school coverage continues this morning on our website. We're keeping an eye on everything you and your kids need to know as they head back to class. So just head to ksat.com slash back to school. 909, about 81 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at 9. Now that federal officials are recommending a third dose of the COVID vaccine, who should get it and when? Answers to those questions and more in our next half hour. After the break, a scene straight out of a thriller movie. A man stuck on the tracks of the New York City subway. How this story ends next in your morning headline. In your morning headlines, two rescues caught on camera, one from a burning workers lift. Another man from a uh, falls onto New York City subway track and another man takes quick action to stop a runaway Jeep on the intersection. RJ Marcus joins us in the studio with all of these stories. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, guys. Some incredible video across the country this morning. A lot of stuff that was caught on cell phone video and a lot of dramatic rescues. And let's go ahead and start in Alabama, where some amazing video this morning shows a painter jump off of a boom lift that was engulfed in flames. Take a look at this video right behind me. You could see that painter up there. What happened here was that the painter's lift actually collided with the power lines and then caught fire. So the man had to jump for his life because the lift was energized by the power lines and firefighters couldn't use water or get their ladders to get to 23 year old Cabrero Ramirez, who was doing a paint job at a Harley Davidson dealership. But the fire chief came up with a quick plan of action. You could see right there to save the man's life. He grabbed a tent at the dealership and then used that as a safety net that Ramirez could aim for. But check this out, Ramirez initially didn't want to jump. He was a little afraid of it until the bottom part of the lift exploded and flames and smoke, as you see right there, shot into the sky. Start yelling jump. I think he knew what he had to do. At first he didn't want to do it. When he did hit, he did not make contact with the ground until everyone holding it set it on the ground. Yeah, so some quick thinking there by that fire chief and those firefighters. About 15 firefighters held the tent for Ramirez, who actually injured his knee and suffered from smoke inhalation. But apparently he was at work the next day, the chief saying that he did stay on the ground. Well, if that video was not dramatic enough for that rescue, we have another rescue caught on camera this morning. This one out of New York City after a man falls into a, off a subway platform onto the tracks with an oncoming train about to speed by. So cell phone video captured the intense moments here. So if you look far in the back, you could see a light at the end of the tunnel showing how close the train was to actually speeding by these tracks. A 60 year old man is lying face down on the tracks when an NYPD officer named Luden Lopez jumps into action. So he carefully steps around the electric third rail. You saw there a little bit earlier to help the unconscious man, but he couldn't lift him by himself. A good Samaritan then jumps down to help Officer Lopez and more riders. We just saw right there help pull all three off the tracks with just seconds to spare. He was like not responding, so I did everything I could to help him up. And thankfully, this gentleman, I don't know who he is, but if he were here, I would shake his hand. He helped me get the, uh, the gentleman back onto the, the platform. It, it just made me feel like like this is what I came here to do. And I, and I felt very uh, fulfilled by that. 
Yeah, great job by Officer Lopez there and that Good Samaritan. Police say the rider fainted and fell onto the tracks and officers were there in the right place at the right time. That man who fell is expected to be okay. Okay, now to Colorado where dash cam video shows another rescue of sorts. This one involving a runaway Jeep. You just saw that dash cam there. A Colorado Springs man sprang into action to stop an empty Jeep from rolling onto the middle of an intersection after it broke loose from a trailer. Bobby Sorden said he tried to get the attention of the driver honking. That didn't work. So he followed the Jeep, ended up running out. You can see dash cam video from his vehicle shows him get out of the car to catch the empty Jeep going onto an oncoming lane of traffic and up a hill. He gets the brake on, good for that, and stops the Jeep from rolling back onto the busy intersection once again. And all of a sudden I see sparks flying off the bottom of the road behind the RV. That was the first thought in my mind. I was like, man, I hope this door is unlocked. And I don't know what I would have done next if the Jeep kept rolling. As a Jeep owner, I know the way that is. When, <laughs> when your Jeep's <laughs> in neutral oh, and it's wow. rolling and you're just trying to do anything you can. Uh, so get this, guys. Sorden's wife and his kids actually flagged down the driver of the trailer who apparently had no clue this happened. <laughs> Uh, thankfully, everyone in this incident was okay. And everyone, I mean, from all three of these stories, um, yeah, everyone's okay. Good. Wanted to go back to that that worker who jumped off of that lift. Oh, my goodness. Uh, a quick footnote to that. The fire chief said also during that interview that if you're ever caught in this situation, having to jump from a two-story building or anything of that sort, um, he said to get into the shape of a cannonball. Yeah. That that's the best way to protect yourself. I had no idea. I, I wouldn't think I would about that way. either when, you know, when I'm standing on fire. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> just, I, yeah. It's not something that probably crosses your mind, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah, Goodness. get into this form of a cannonball and that's... Uh, I, well, I'm yeah. more amazed by the ingenu ingenuity of them yes. grabbing that, that the tent. camping that tent, tent. Yes. from a nearby yeah. dealership. I guess yeah. Heavy Rescue doesn't carry around you know, those giant things to cushion somebody's fall. Yeah, that's a good point as well. Maybe like a inflatable or mm -hmm. something like that. Or maybe yeah. that first crew that was there just happened not to have something like yeah. that. Right, yeah. they but, improvised. Uh, yes. Yeah. Good job there by everyone involved. Thank you, yeah. RJ. Thank you. Good luck with the Thanks, Jeep. Guys. Yeah, good luck with the Jeep. Yeah, take <laughs> care of your Jeep. Put it in park, not neutral. <laughs> yeah, the first thing I thought of was, yeah, what would have happened if the door had been locked? Oh, my goodness. Time. But he got oh. it, and he told his wife, go chase him go. down, tell him their Jeep's back Yeah, here. I'm glad it worked out for them, all of them. <laughs> Let's check in with uh, Justin now, and one of the things that we've been tracking all summer has been, are we actually going to reach 100 this summer? Well, look, it's it's an arbitrary number, okay? It's 100. Nothing, you know, really happens at 100. 32 is an important number, 100. It's just sort of a benchmark, if you will. But mm -hmm. uh, we do track it, and we haven't had any 100-degree days so far this year. Uh, let's look at the numbers. Zero. Uh, the hottest days have been the last couple days, 98. Uh, and we're forecasting 98 again today. So we're going to get awful close, and I really think early next week there's a real shot at touching 100 here in San Antonio. Compare that to last year, though. We had 36 days of 100 degrees or above, our hottest being 107 on July 13th. So we're doing a lot better this year than we did last year when it comes to the heat. That being said, it's still very humid, and temperatures are in the upper 90s. And so, uh, again, Hot is hot, right? And uh, we'll be seeing heat index values up around 104, I think, here in San Antonio today. This is the forecast. That's the high temperature. The yellow number would be your forecast heat index. We're going to go as high as 106 Pleasanton, 108 down there on Catula on the bottom of your screen, Victoria 105. So you get the idea here. And outside right now, we're losing those morning clouds pretty quickly. So temperatures will be uh, jumping up. 81 southerly winds at about 11 miles per hour, and we already have a heat index of 86 at this hour. You see some of the clouds working through. These tend to scatter out pretty quickly. Uh, 81 Stinson, 82 Pleasanton, 80 right now in Hondo, 78 Uvalde, a little bit more cloud cover out west, 82 in Del Rio, and mostly sunny skies in Victoria, 84 there. Dew points, here we go again, 70s. Um, these numbers have been slowly kind of trending down, but this is going to take a lot of time. There's still a lot of moisture in the soil, and so that tends to keep the dew points up because we've had so much rain over the summer. But these numbers should start to trend down by early next week, and hopefully that'll help us out a little bit with the heat index. But again, today, high temperatures up around 98. You can expect mostly sunny skies and south southeasterly winds 10 to 20. Do want to mention very quickly that we don't expect any rain today, but as we get into tomorrow, there's just enough moisture there where the models are hinting at a shower or two, especially south of Highway 90. That's around 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So there is about a 10% chance of a shower tomorrow. 
I think most of us probably stay dry, but that uh, that potential is there. High pressure really is the big story here, but as we go south, we've been tracking grace for better part of a week now. Winds are at 85 miles per hour. This thing's looking better and better. It's getting a little bigger too, and it is forecast to make landfall right in between Tampico and Veracruz. And you can see how big the wind field is there. Tropical storm force winds in that yellow color there. Bringing a lot of rain to places like Mexico City. Winds will still be at 40 miles per hour Saturday afternoon and then finally weakening. Some of the rainfall totals, 6 to 12 inches there on the east coast of Mexico. So there could be some flooding. And we've got to talk about Henri too because winds are at 65 miles per hour with this. This is out in the Atlantic. There's the east coast of the United States. This is going to move north towards New York and Boston, potentially as a Category 1 storm. This is a big deal because this is going to cause potentially a little bit of flooding. There will be some storm surge, and uh, that will bring more rain to the northeast before it gets pulled off uh, out to the Atlantic. So again, high pressure is in control. That's going to keep temperatures pretty warm. Now, as we get into the middle part of next week, that high pressure tries to move out of the way. And that may allow for some showers and storms Wednesday, Thursday of next week. We'll keep you posted there. But 99 Monday, we're going to get close, guys. Close to that 100 mark. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. You got it. Still ahead on TMS 89, part three of my summer fishing series. Today, we're taking you inside a local lure company, Livingston Lures. Welcome back, 925. Okay, I looked it up. Americans spend at least $50 billion a year. Artificial lures like this old school super spook have dominated fishing for decades. A San Antonio company has spent almost 10 years taking tackle high tech. Here's part three of my summer fishing series. This could be a warehouse anywhere, but this one holds the inventory for San Antonio-based Livingston Lures. Eric Arnoldson says it all started with one of those musical greeting cards. The inventor of the lure, um, he invented the sound. He got a Christmas card in the, in the mail one day and said, hey, if I could get a Christmas card to, to make sound, I can put it in a lure. So we took it over in 2012. We started going to all the major trade shows and uh, the rest is history. I'm like a kid in a candy store in here. Let's see, from all these lures, I like these topwater frogs here, and maybe one of these square bill crankbaits that looks like a shad. But what's different about these from ones you find in most tackle stores is this one actually sounds like a bullfrog, and this one sounds like a shad. It's the only lure in the world that mimics the bait fish. You know, companies have been using fishing lures for over 50 years with a rattle. We're the only company that has the actual biological sound of a bait fish, so that's what sets us apart. Livingston also sells a waterproof speaker designed to replace bait in crab pots in places like the Bering Sea. Are we talking Deadliest Catch guys? Yeah, the Deadliest Catch. Yeah, we were actually featured on the Deadliest Catch, uh, um, showing our product and talking about our product and then showing the result. Back to the lures, Arnoldson says the competition is fierce in the fight for angler dollars, but he says every now and then work becomes play. Love when prototypes come in because my excuse is I have to leave the office. I have to go throw some baits. He has to go fishing. Thanks to Eric and everybody over at Livingston Lures. Now, they don't have a storefront operation, but like, like most companies, they have a huge presence on the web and social media. Their biggest customer is Bass Pro Shops. Eric mm -hmm. says their lures, like this one, are on about a dollar more than traditional lures due to that circuit board and the speaker inside. To see all my fishing stories, go to ksat.com, and we will post this one later this morning on ksat.com. Com. I that just, one has a speaker. That's pretty cool. Yeah, the they, all, they all do. I just won this one at that uh, charity fishing tournament uh, recently out at Medina Lake. Oh, this was cool. a giveaway to everybody that participated. Really? So I have to check it out. I have nice. to report back. Yeah. So so this one has the rattle. Uh huh. And this one makes that weird chirpy sound. I think the chirpy sound will work for you. We'll find out. <laughs> I hope so. I'll keep you posted. All right. It's a lot more ahead on GMSA at nine. Uh, over the past year, more than 17,000 tickets given to people driving without a valid license in San Antonio. Uh, later, how a local judge is making sure those drivers get the education they need to stay safe on the roads, especially the younger ones. Also after the break, a local expert explains who should get the COVID-19 booster shot and when. 
And welcome back. It's about 932. Federal health officials have announced the need for a third dose of the COVID-19 shot. Well, a lot of unanswered questions remain about that extra dose. For some answers, we turn to a local expert, Dr. Jason Bowling, Director of Epidemiology at University Health. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Glad you're with us on this Friday. First off, who should be getting this booster shot or booster dose? Right. Great question. So currently it is approved for people that have taken either the received either the Pfizer or Moderna courses and have issues that impact their immune system. So examples would be someone that's had an organ transplant, someone receiving chemotherapy for cancer, or if they're taking other medicines that can impact their immune system. So if you have a condition that impacts your immune system, you should talk to your doctor to see if you might be a candidate for this booster dose. And a lot of people have been talking about this, like what is the time frame in which people should be getting that third dose? So it's recommended for these people with immune system issues that they receive the third dose at least four weeks after they've had the second dose of the vaccine series. At least, okay, got it. We've also heard some concerns about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, Dr. Bowling. Uh, what if someone got that single dose vaccine and now they want that booster shot, does that, does that work? So currently there's not information about a third dose or a second dose, I should say, for the Johnson Johnson, since that's really a one dose vaccine series, they still don't have data on whether or not a second dose or a booster dose for that Johnson Johnson vaccine series is needed. They're looking into that, so there should be some information coming forward soon. But currently this recommendation for boosters is only for people that have received either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. All right, Dr. Bowling, while we've got you here, I want to throw you a couple curveballs and ask you a couple of other questions. First one has to do with what appears to be a wave of pediatric cases. Is that what you're seeing on your end as well? So we are seeing more children uh, infected with COVID-19 and younger people in general. A large part of that reflects the fact that children are not yet eligible to receive the vaccine under 12. Um, and younger people in general have been less vaccinated than older people. And so I think that's really the driving force for why we're seeing more younger people, including children uh, with COVID-19. And Dr. Bowling, you were talking earlier a little bit about the time frame in which uh, these, these people should be getting the third dose. What if they miss that window? What's the option then? So it's okay to get it later. Um, it's okay if you get it you know, well past four weeks from the second dose. The key thing is they don't want someone getting it before four weeks after that second dose because you need enough time for your immune system to generate antibodies for that third dose to provide that additional boost that you're looking for. All right, thank you, Dr. Bowling, for joining us this morning. Thank you very much for having me. Have a great day. You too, doctor. Speaking of vaccines, an update on those incentives for those looking for a shot. Metro Health confirming federal funds have been approved, uh, now approved the gift cards meant to encourage vaccinations. There's another round of approval that is underway within the city, but Metro Health says the plan is to give out $100 HEB gift cards after a second dose is received. This would happen, uh, be happening at city vaccine clinics. Metro Health hopes to have that incentive finalized and launched by the end of the month. That's kind of a big deal, so we will keep you updated on that. And some local school districts still struggling with the decision when it comes to mask mandates. Northeast ISD held an emergency school board meeting last night to discuss that issue. Now, some people waited hours to stand up and share their thoughts. KSAT 12's John Paul Baraja shares what parents on both sides of the issue have to say. Northeast ISD is debating on issuing a mass mandate. Those on both sides of the mass packed the district building. Multiple overflow rooms had to be used and 151 people signed up for public comment. There are at least six students in one third grade classroom at home right now fighting this virus. We are not free if parents do not have the ability to make informed decisions concerning our children's health. A district's assistant director of health services recommended a potential six week mass mandate to slow the spread of COVID. According to her presentation, the Delta variant is likely to spread to five to nine others when one person is infected. She adds it's too early to tell, but right now elementary classrooms are seeing the majority of cases. What they want to do is they want to turn away student who doesn't go go to school with the mask passport. That's exactly what it is. Every child under the age of 12 is not eligible to be vaccinated right now. They are relying on the mask to protect them. Throughout presentations and public comment, the crowds had to be asked to refrain from applauding <laughs> and booing as everyone's emotions are running high. 
Again, that was uh, KSIS John Paul Barajas reporting. As we go to live cam real quick, I want to pass along some uh, news that we're getting across the wires now. Mike Richards, the new host of Jeopardy, just announced he's stepping down after offensive comments he made on a podcast came to light. That story just coming in. Here's Justin. Okay, and you saw the scene outside there, pretty steamy looking. We've got a lot of humidity cloud cover for now. Those clouds aren't going to last very long. We'll see a lot of sun today, and temperatures will be right back where they were yesterday. Here's a bit of good news. Pollen count is in. Molds are low. Ragweed shows up today, but it's in the low category. Pigweed is also low. Looking at temperatures, we are now in the 80s in many spots here around San Antonio. 81 Stinson, 82 at Randolph, 82 New Braunfels, 77 Tarpley, 74 Los Maples. Clouds are already starting to thin out some, and you can expect mostly sunny skies today. 98, your high temperature, southeast chilly winds, 10 to 20 miles per hour. And coming up here in just a bit, guys, we uh, talked about it a little earlier. The news coming out of Greenland, some unexpected rain there. We're going to have the latest and dig into that coming up in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Taking a quick look out with TransGuide, there is a shot at I-35 in Nogalitos, and as you can see, traffic is backed up on one side of that highway. Yeah, we don't have a lot of information there, but it's really, it's barely moving in that one direction. We'll try to get a direction for you and find out what's going on uh, here before the end of the newscast. Well, topic one this week, and again this morning, continues to be COVID. Questions lingering as kids head back to class. Another wave of kids heading back to school starting this coming Monday. And later today, San Antonio leaders will hold a town hall to answer some of the questions local children submitted earlier this week. And for more details, we're going to turn to RJ Marcus. Good morning again. Yeah, guys, and obviously we saw there Dr. Bowling talking about uh, COVID within schools and how, you know, shots and vaccines. And of course, that is a, the big topic of conversation. So over the past two weeks, kids around the city have submitted questions about the COVID-19 vaccine and COVID-19 itself with help from their parents, of course. So many Metro Health Director Claude Jacob says he is looking forward to hearing from kids in our community as they and their families try to navigate the start of the school year. A majority of students have returned to the classroom already, but multiple schools don't start until next week. San Antonio's biggest school districts, Northside, Northeast and San Antonio ISDs have approved mask requirements of their own as courts decide the legalities of the mandates. Any ISD, as we just saw right there, was the latest to hold an emergency meeting and improve a temporary mandate that goes into to effect on Monday. So interesting stuff there for parents and kids to know about with Northeast ISD. The Texas Supreme Court ruled yesterday that school mask mandates can remain for now. With major changes in just two weeks alone, children have many questions about these mandates and what they mean for them. Some of those questions could be answered today. So again, the town hall is scheduled to air at noon today and it will be live streamed on KSAT.com. The virtual event will include Jacob, Mayor Ron Nuremberg, and Methodist Children's Hospital Pediatric Emergency Room Physician Dr. Whitney Schwartz. And again, guys, just let you guys know it is starting at noon and we're told it's a mix of videos and email submissions from local children with the approval, of course, of their parents. Well, <laughs> Got to make sure that, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's time we hear from the kids. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. They're the ones that are kind of in the mix here. So mm -hmm. uh, it'd be kind of good to just sort of know their thoughts and feelings as to what is going on and a little bit maybe of the confusion that they're having. right we'll now. We'll get some questions answered. All right. Sure. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And you're watching GMSA at 9. Right now it's 940, about 81 degrees. A new court-led effort in San Antonio to get unlicensed drivers properly educated. How that works after the break. The San Antonio Municipal Courts created a new specialized court docket that's targeting young, unlicensed drivers. Erica Hernandez stopped by the SA Road Ready Court to explain how it works. From July 2020 to July 2021, roughly 17,400 tickets were given to people for driving with an invalid driver's license or no license at all. Of those ticketed drivers, about 29% were between the ages of 17 to 24. It's a significant amount of individuals that are driving without a driver's license in that age group. Presiding Judge Carla Obledo has helped put together SA Road Ready Court for Young Drivers and it officially launched on July 15th. The ultimate goal of this court is to not only provide resources, but also to reduce the amount of unlicensed drivers on San Antonio roadways. 
what we've done with this SA Road Ready Court is created a more structured program. It is a deferred disposition, which is, is similar to a probation, and it contains timelines that individuals need to complete certain requirements. The docket for this court is heard every Thursday. Ticketed individuals meet with the judge, and then a timeline is laid out that includes driver's education courses. It usually takes about six months to complete. Ultimately, we would like to expand this program, but since there's such a significant number of drivers in this age group that are involved in motor vehicle accidents, that's why we really wanted to target this group first. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Back to weather and climatology. Justin joined us now. We ran a story in the early newscast about rain showing up in a very unlikely place. Right. It's a very strange occurrence. It is basically the coldest place in the northern hemisphere. We're talking about Greenland, okay? It's a, a giant ice sheet up there. And at the summit, so the peak there in Greenland, rain was reported last weekend. What's the significance of that? Well, it's never been reported there before. Now, keep in mind, they started keeping records in the 1980s. But this is significant because temperatures rose above freezing for the third time this decade there. And that resulted in the first time they ever saw rain at the summit. Uh, and some scientists believe that this is an indication of climate change. So you look at the Greenland summit there, it's 10,551 feet above sea level. That's about two miles. And again, as I mentioned, this is the third time in less than a decade that they've had above freezing temperatures there. And that heavy rainfall occurred over the ice sheet and some of the ice was lost. Uh, so scientists are looking at this very closely. It's sort of a significant event. We'll see where we go uh, as we go forward in time here, what, what kind of uh, evolves out of this. But uh, you can bet they're going to be looking at this even closer uh, in the coming years. Uh, as it looks like things are warming up a little bit, obviously. Right now, we'll go outside for you. 81 degrees, mostly cloudy skies at the airport. Southerly winds at about 11 miles per hour. Feels like 86. Dew point is at 73. It is awful humid out there. When you look at the satellite picture, you see the clouds lining up here. These will start to dissipate. 84 Port SA, 77 right now, Bernie Stage, 80 in Hondo, 83 Castroville, 82 Carrizo Springs, 83 in Catula, 81 right now in Kennedy. Clouds thinning out there as well, and the dew points are very high, near 80 yet again. I feel like we've been looking at uh, dew point around 80 in Gonzales each and every morning. That is extremely high. These dew points do fall off some during the afternoon, and it's we get into next week, we should see a gradual decrease in these dew points, but it, it just takes some time. And once we get to 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we start to look at heat indices above 100. I think we'll see that here in San Antonio today, 104 potentially. Later this afternoon, 106 in Pleasanton, 108, the peak heat index down there in Catula. So another very hot day. And we look at the forecast, there's no rain, uh, not today, but tomorrow, there's just enough moisture rotating in here where we could get a stray shower or two. I think it's probably south of Highway 90 places like Dilly, Catula, over to Carrizo Springs, stray shower. But uh, even this computer model shows maybe one here around San Antonio. We are going to put in a 10% chance of rain, but don't expect much. Okay, and that's really our only chance of rain, if at all, uh, over the next couple days. Now, as we get into the middle part of next week, that does change a little bit. High pressure is in control, and that's what's keeping us very toasty. Grace is still down here churning. Winds at 85 miles per hour, gusting to 105. It's moving west at 14. It's gained, this uh, system's gotten a little bigger, too. And so that means the winds are going to uh, spread. Tropical storm force winds are going to spread from Tampico down to Veracruz, as this makes landfall as a Category 2 hurricane, they now think, according to the Hurricane Center. And it moves towards Mexico City, dropping some very heavy rain uh, before dissipating. Uh, coming up tomorrow. Uh, the rainfall totals 6 to 12 inches. And I think there could be some isolated spots of 18 inches. So there's going to be some flooding in Mexico. Meantime, we do have to mention Henri. This is a tropical storm. Winds at 65 miles per hour just off the east coast there, Florida and the Carolinas. Uh, this is forecast to move north. And what's significant about it is that we do think it'll make landfall somewhere in New England as a category one storm. Uh, this is going to bring some storm surge and very heavy rain there. It's going to be a quick mover, uh, but that'll cause some issues across the northeast. Meantime, our forecast, high pressure sort of wobbles around, but it's here through early next week. And then by the middle part of next week, it starts to move north a little bit. 
underneath the ridge, we could see a few disturbances rolling through. And so by Wednesday and Thursday, we're adding some rain chances back and temperatures come down a little bit. Here's how it looks in the seven day forecast. There's that 10% chance tomorrow, 98 Sunday, 99 Monday. We cool it down just a little bit by Wednesday and Thursday and a 20% chance of rain by Thursday, guys. We will power through the heat. Thank you, Justin. A few consumer headlines this morning. A lot of people get nervous when flying and to take the edge off. They do have a drink or two on the plane. That option has not been available in main cabins at several airlines, including American Airlines since earlier this summer. And now it looks like it won't be an option anytime soon. The suspension part of an effort to cut down on unruly and violent passengers. Main cabin alcohol service at American was set to resume September 13th when the transportation mask mandate was originally set to expire. That mandate has been extended to January of 2022. American says it's extending its suspension on main cabin alcohol drink service to match that date. The FAA has received upwards of 3,800 unruly passenger reports so far this year. There were more than 2,800 mass related incidents reported with fines now totaling over a million dollars. Elon Musk says Tesla is creating a humanoid robot. He says it will have a screen where a person's face would be and it'll perform boring, repetitive and dangerous work. Musk says a prototype could be available next year. Some experts say building a humanoid robot has proven difficult and that Musk has a history of over promising. Stars who attend the Emmy Awards this year will have to prove they're vaccinated against COVID or they'll have to test negative for the virus within a few days of each event. The Academy says the requirements are for the telecast and creative arts ceremonies. Those events will take place behind a theater in Los Angeles in an air conditioned tent. In the same announcement, the Academy says it's adding two categories to the telecast, uh, including outstanding variety sketch series and outstanding live variety special. And time now about 951 and 82 degrees out there. They may not live in a pineapple, <laughs> but they're under the sea. Next on GMSA, we'll show you the real life SpongeBob and Patrick. And a quick look at Trans Guide at 955. You're looking at the situation we were seeing earlier at I-35 and Nocalitos. Apparently the lanes that are slowing down is right there on the northbound lanes headed to downtown. So it's slow. There's a, quite a bit of a slowdown. A lot of cars piling up. Although I think, Mark, I think it's moving a little bit more than it was. Yeah, earlier. it looks like off in the distance there it starts to ease up a bit, but just be advised. Got a cute story from KSAT.com. Headline Scuba Diver finds real life SpongeBob and Patrick hanging out in the ocean. And what's funny when I first read the headline without reading the article I was like where's the pineapple so the article starts out <laughs> they may not live in a pineapple but they're certainly hanging out under the sea yeah yellow sponge pink starfish hanging out together and the scientist Dr. Christopher Ma realized that you just stumbled across across a real life SpongeBob SquarePants and Patrick Star <laughs> it says granted this sponge is more of a blob than a square but seriously what are the chances that two of the most iconic underwater cartoon characters just happen to be next to each other check it out on ksat.com yeah super cute That's article cool. have a great weekend guys see you back here at noon